morning, ladies and gents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gents, welcome. Uh, my voice is a little hoarse today. It's because of the Brisbane Raw Grand Final yesterday. <laughs> so uh, bear with me on that fact. So my name is Patrick Bowman. I'm the CEO of the Asthma Foundation of Queensland. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Foundation staff, who have worked extremely hard to bring you this event, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Foundation's 2014 World Asthma Day Symposium. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our principal sponsors, AstraZeneca, for their generous support, which has enabled us to bring this symposium to you. Thank you also to Bird Healthcare, Novartis, and all our exhibitors here today. It would be remiss of me not to mention our national body, Asthma Australia, who continue to work dynamically with our team to provide positive health camps for people with asthma and to ensure asthma remains a national health priority now and into the future. Whilst many of you will know that Asthma Foundation Queensland has delivered a health pro professional symposium to mark World Asthma Day for a number of years, 2014 represents the first year the symposium has been held nationally. Over the next week, each state foundation will be holding a symposium ensuring this fabulous initiative now benefits health professionals throughout the country. Asthma is a significant public issue throughout Australia. There are varying levels of severity and different levels of self-management in asthma control. As we all know, asthma is a manageable condition. With effective treatment, the majority of people with asthma will enjoy a normal and healthy life. However, asthma continues to have a significant impact on the lives of people with asthma and their caregivers. Many with poorly controlled asthma primarily see it as a physical health issue, with few thinking that it has other impacts on their life. Whether it's taking time off work or not being able to run around with the kids, symptoms from uncontrolled asthma have a major greater impact than just the physical. The Foundation's vision and purpose is about doing the best we can to provide assistance and care for over 400,000 Queenslanders with asthma and their caregivers. We are also committed to supporting research that looks towards a cure and improvements in, in, in management. This is reflected in this event today. Asthma Foundation Queensland currently makes a financial contribution in excess of $80,000 per annum to asthma research. This is one of the more significant contributions from across the country. A large proportion of this money is administered through Asthma Australia's National Research Programme, so that the best research and PhD students can, can be supported wherever they work across Australia. An eminent panel of reviewers assesses applications each year to identify high quality work with promising outcomes to be supported. I again specifically want to thank our partners, AstraZeneca, who assist with the funding of this work. We are pleased to welcome our keynote speakers, Dr. Nathan Bartlett, Professor Joe Douglas, and Professor Peter Walk, and look forward to sharing their insights into better management of asthma. We also welcome our afternoon workshop presenters, Mr. Darren Smith and Ms. Jan Shafey. To begin the official proceedings, and in recognition of the original custodians of the land upon which we meet today, I'd like to ask Songwon Marucci to address this gathering. Songwon Marucci is a graduate of the Victorian College of the Arts in Melbourne. She is an internationally renowned opera singer and was the first Australian to perform at the United Nations in New York in 1993 in honour of the International Year for the, world's in, for the World's Indigenous People. Please welcome Songwon Marucci. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Songwum Namuruchi. I very much appreciate and acknowledge. I would now like to ask our Assistant Health Minister, Dr. Chris Davis, to officially open the 2014 World Asthma Day Symposium. Dr. Chris Davis is a highly valued advocate of the Asthma Foundation Queensland, with the Stafford Electorate Office providing ongoing support for our events and activities. Please provide a warm welcome to Dr. Chris Davis. Thank you. Morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, uh, Queenslanders. Um, it's a great honour to be with you all today, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for your kind uh, welcome there. 
And uh, I'd also like uh, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered, um, and uh, particularly the elders past and present. Uh, it's always a delight to return to Prince Charles Hospital, um, as I in fact worked here as the Director of Geriatric Medicine for some uh, 20 years, and uh, it's inevitable at a major cardiothoracic hospital uh, that one becomes uh, very aware um, of uh, conditions uh, such as asthma, of course, and the major contribution that the healthcare team here have uh, contributed to our knowledge, but most importantly, the improved management of uh, asthma in terms of uh, guidelines and other contributions um, over the years. And uh, as we know, we've seen the benefits of the tremendous research, the tremendous knowledge gains, but also the benefits of the focus um, of moving uh, from a very medically centric model uh, to one that actually empowers patients, empowers families, empowers the healthcare team, and of course tries to maintain the management of asthma uh, in the community uh, as far as possible because, because we know that that leads to the best quality of life for people living with asthma and uh, it also has other great benefits such as allowing people of course to minimise their days uh, of reduced productivity as a result of asthma. And so all of those issues are, are ones that we can be very proud of, but uh, are also a constant reminder that we can always do better. Uh, because as Patrick uh, mentioned earlier there, um, we still have a significant burden of asthma in our community. And the other reason that we need to do better, apart from the obvious humanitarian one, uh, is that simply we, we, we're not going to have the resources that we've uh, been able to enjoy in the healthcare system um, over the last decade or so. And if you just look at Queensland Health, um, we've actually seen that uh, we, we've had healthcare inflation, if you will, or hospital care inflation, running at about 12% per annum for the decade at a time when our revenue generation as a state, despite the resources boom and other favourable circumstances has been growing at about 6% per annum, so that's part of the gap that we have and uh, as we're hearing from now the federal government in particular, uh, there's going to be even more pressure um, on our public health uh, dollar. And so what is the best way for us to respond to the challenge? Well, the, the, the response is to continue doing what we've been doing but do it even better. And so the ongoing research that you're going to hear from our distinguished uh, speakers this morning is a, is a critical part of understanding the, the insights, the pathogenesis of uh, why we still have uh, asthma, the, the, the further horizons that we have in terms of ongoing research, but also very critically how we can actually do even better to help people um, living with asthma comply with medication, understand the techniques uh, that are so necessary for them to actually be literally their, their own healthcare practitioner because uh, all the research says that that is what is there. And so this is where uh, days such as World Asthma Day are so critical in terms of a reminder of how important it is to get that right. But it's also obviously an opportunity uh, to show the support uh, of all of us in the community for, for people living with asthma, one, one in ten or so. And uh, also, as I quickly saw Professor Douglas's uh, slides flash through there, uh, despite the enormous advantages, I mean, when I was a, a junior doctor in the late 70s and early 80s, um, uh, our emergency departments were just full uh, with, with asthma rooms, as I think they were mostly called, uh, with the aminophilin drips and the frantic use of nebulizers, and it's, it's, it's great that uh, we've been able to reduce the mortality by something like 70% or so uh, since, since that era. Um, but it's a reminder that we constantly need to do more because everybody who has a, an unfortunate outcome with asthma is essentially an avoidable um, incident. And so, uh, again, it's just through that compliance. And if you look at many of the 
organisations that have been able to do really well in our community in terms of uh, maximising their benefit from new technologies and so on. Uh, it is the big unified organisation, so we, we've seen the way that the banking sector has transformed itself over the last couple of decades, the airline industries, the retailing industries, they're all using technology to much greater advantage. And one of the problems we've had in health is that because of the fragmented approach that we have to, to health, uh, particularly the state-commonwealth divide, there has not been that unified leadership and so the unified leadership really needs to be through, through public opinion. And so we, we do need to integrate the ability to have our asthma app, I think it's called Asthma Buddy, and encourage people to record, to actually develop the habits that are actually so critical and then work with their healthcare team to, to maximise that and, and then generate the data as to what really works. And, uh, uh, I think it's going to be a matter when it comes to advocating uh, for asthma um, and as we heard, you know, definitely because of the impact on our community needs to remain a national health priority but wouldn't it be great if we actually got it off the uh, register of national health priorities because we'd actually made such huge progress in actually uh, dealing with it uh, so that uh, people weren't having to live with the burden to the same extent and so we will do that as I say, by, by that empowerment process, using a combination of technology and uh, working with communities and individuals. And so where I sit, um, that is one of the big issues that I'm really keen to do is to uh, work with communities, work uh, with uh, the new research, the new technologies to empower people to, to make all the difference. And so for everybody in the room who's uh, either uh, living as a patient or a support person or as a family member uh, with, uh, with asthma to all the health professionals in the room to all the uh, leadership team uh, within organisations such as the Asthma Foundation, uh, very vitally with our key academics and researchers who are providing the, the new insights. I say thank you all for everything you're doing and I really look forward uh, as we uh, celebrate uh, progress in this area uh, to seeing uh, us building on the great outcomes that uh, you've all contributed to thus far. So have a very successful, a very uh, productive day and uh, most importantly take the learnings from today uh, back out there to, to benefit your fellow Queenslanders. Thank you. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Joe Douglas, who is actually visiting a number of the symposium around the country in the next uh, couple of days. So thank you very much, Joe, on behalf of Asthma Foundation Queensland and Asthma Australia. Um, Joe is a um, specialist physician with clinical and research interests in asthma and allergic disease. She is currently head of the Department of Clinical Immunology and Allergy at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and an honorary clinical professor at the University of Melbourne. Jo has always had a commitment to research and teaching with 90 career academic publications, so far with particular inter research interests including asthma in older people and exercise-induced asthma. She, is currently, so she has, has um, current research interest in severe asthma and the immune mechanisms of asthma and allergic disease in collaboration with her colleagues at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, the University of Melbourne and the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. She continues an active involvement in undergraduate and postgraduate university and clinical teaching, and also is a frequent attendee and a speaker at local and international meetings. Jo has um, active community roles. She's been a member of the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy since 1994, and was president from 2010 to 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in welcoming Professor Jo Douglas. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to see such a packed room for Asthma Week. It's fantastic. I'd like to really thank the organisers for the opportunity to speak and for the invitation and for the wonderful um, welcome by Song Songerman Marucci. So my job today is to talk about severe asthma and I want to talk about the burdens and opportunities and for me it's a really exciting time because when I was a, a, an intern and a resident in 1985 We'd put someone in a room with severe asthma and we'd give them Ventolin and steroids and we'd hope they get better. And up until about three or four years ago, that was pretty much what we did. 
But interestingly and fascinatingly, in the last four or five years, the genomic revolution has really changed the opportunities. And we've both got drugs available to us to treat people that we've not had access to before in a chronic sense. And moreover, there is a fantastic pipeline of new pharmaceuticals, which I'll touch on, which really will provide a very different opportunity for many of those people who suffer from severe asthma. So that's what I want to talk about today, and hopefully we can all learn something about that. I should declare my many conflicts of interest, so you, you know that. So I want to talk a little bit about asthma prevalence and mortality. I want to talk about difficult asthma in a very practical sense, what to do. Can I just ask, who have we got in the room? We've got general practitioners, a few, some, a few, great. And we've got some asthma specialist nurses, quite a few. Physios, asthma, edu physios, yeah. asthma educators, great, fantastic spectrum. So I know where I'm talking to. And I want to talk about difficult asthma, what to do in a diagnostic sense, which particularly I think is relevant for those at the first line of meeting patients, so such as general practitioners. I want to talk about further defining severe asthma and how we can perhaps improve outcomes by doing that, because that changes the way we do things. And then look at, talk about some of those new treatments that I mentioned a minute ago. Now, I shouldn't have to tell this audience, but I'll just remind you what we call asthma. Because asthma is a disease of variable airflow obstruction. And I mean that looking at, these, um, at the flow volume loop here, which is reversible with beta-2 agonist with bronchodilator. There's also the process of inflammation, which we can see here on this bronchoscopy, which was done after allergen challenge in someone who has asthma, showing significant airway inflammation. And if we biopsy that airway, what we can see is a cellular infiltrate. Um, which is lymphocytes and eosinophils infiltrating the submucosal area. And also, very importantly, this thickened green area here, which is airway remodelling, a thickened basement membrane, which changes the nature of the airway and changes its response to many of the medications that we provide for asthma. If I want to look at asthma, I can talk about time trends in prevalence. How many people have asthma today? You may be surprised or may not be to know that asthma is probably the most common chronic illness in our community with somewhere between 9 to 11 percent of people, of adults, suffering from it and more children, something of the order of, depending how you measure it, 18 to 20 percent of seven-year-olds. So it's an incredibly common disease that affects very many in our community. And if we look at the prevalence, it is increasing, it was increasing through the last decades of the last century, and if anything is perhaps decreasing in this century. But there's an interesting phenomenon around that, and if we look at those who are over the age of 70 with asthma, that number is increasing substantially, as if this cohort is growing up and moving through into older age. So whilst the prevalence in young children is decreasing a little, it's certainly increasing in the older group, and that's why that causes a focus of our research attention. If I look at community asthma, we have fantastic medications for asthma. The combined inhaled corticosteroids, long-acting beta agonists, uh, provide great control of asthma for the majority of people. And this is data taken from general practices, mostly in New South Wales and looked at the severity of asthma by patients presenting to their general practitioner. And if you look at the proportion of adults presenting with asthma, sorry, I couldn't get this right, the proportion of adults presenting with asthma, if we look in the purple is the very mild, pale pink is mild, white is moderate, and blue is severe. And what we can see is the majority of people who have presented to the general practice over this uh, five-year period, six-year period, is in fact in the mild and moderate group, with only a few, uh, sorry, mild and very mild group, with only a few going into the moderate and severe. An international consensus would suggest that something like one in 20 people that we see with <coughs> asthma fall into that severe group. So most people have mild or moderate disease, which can be controlled with current medications. And yet the problem with the severe 5% is that that is the group in whom there is the most burden in terms of hospital presentations, in terms of exacerbations, and in terms of impact on life. And so it's particularly this severe group which has formed the focus of a great deal of attention in the past 10 to 20 years. Now another way of asking the question, what is severe asthma, is to look at those who die of asthma. Because <laughs> despite other definitions, I guess if someone dies of asthma, it's a pretty good assumption that their asthma was severe. 
And as has already been spoken by the Minister today, Australia has an amazing success story, and indeed probably the world, but Australia led the world in some ways in recognising and then tackling the burden of asthma mortality. And so back in the um, mid-80s when I was a young resident and registrar, the mortality of asthma was over a thousand souls per year were lost to asthma and the majority of those were in the 5 to 34 age group. Now losing someone to asthma at any time is tragic, but 5 to 34 years of age is particularly tragic. And Australia saw the burden. The National Asthma Council was set up, which was, and the founding partner of that was Asthma Australia. And so there was substantial public health efforts devoted to reducing this very significant burden, which was disproportionate to that which was occurring in the rest of the world. And really, it's a success story with asthma mortality now about a third of what it was um, 20 years ago. So it is. Um, a true success story in public health, and there's not so many of them. But if we look, one of the things that informed those public health initiatives were studies of asthma death. And so in the past 10 years, there's not been a good study of asthma mortality, except the one that we decided to do, looking at asthma mortality 2005 to 2009 in Australia, and looking at the reasons surrounding that to see if we could identify what were the drivers now of those who are dying from asthma. And should we consider the three to 400 individuals who die a year from asthma in Australia now, should we consider those deaths preventable? So this is a table of the numbers of people who died of asthma 2005 to 2009, the five year period for which we could contain most data. And this is the overall numbers um, the, from the Bureau of Statistics. And you can see that the majority of people who die of asthma are now in the older age groups, 40 and over. And in fact, if you analyse the data clearly, two thirds of those who die of asthma are in the over 55 age group. So most people who die of asthma are in the older age group, which is fantastic that we've reversed that trend of the five to 34 year age, old age group, but then not many would think that 55 or 56 is a particularly good time to um, demise from asthma either. And so that's the group if we're going to reduce asthma mortality we need to pay particular attention to. Now this study looked at actually not just those numbers who died but looked at those for which there was good data and that happened to be coroner's data. And so for those under 70, more than 70% of them who died of asthma were referred to the coroner and that's the group that we we're able to study. And we're able to show that the numbers who died of asthma in each state were, as a proportion of population, not dissimilar. And we are able to look and identify the circumstances around those who actually died. And in 70% of those people who died, there were modifiable factors that were identified. So delay in seeking help or barriers to accessing care, as in previous asthma mortality studies, was a major cause and a disproportionate number of these people lived in very so low socioeconomic environments, rooming houses, boarding houses, caravan parks, so had very few social supports and had a very disadvantaged one would consider social environment. The other feature which was su a surprise to us and was not such a feature in previous asthma mortality studies was that alcohol and tobacco use, but particularly alcohol and other drug use, was a major association with those who had died of asthma. And it was present in over 60% of cases. And it really, to us, brought out the fact that asthma and drug use, whether that be alcohol or <coughs> illicit drugs, was a major risk factor for those not recognising a severe asthma attack and indeed succumbing to it, if one looked at this study. And many of them went to bed with asthma, had had a few drinks, took a few other things, and were not alive in the morning. So, and asthma was definitely diagnosed by the coroner on their lung specimens. So, pretty clearly that was a major risk factor and those things are modifiable. That's a treatable, addiction is treatable. Many of them had also the old canary of inadequate asthma preventer therapy and I'll go into that again a bit later. And I've, I've already mentioned the social isolation which was such an important part of those things. So if we're going to make a difference to asthma mortality going forward, these are some of the things we need to look at. All right, let's change tack a little bit. Having talked about severe asthma, how to define it, and also um, how much it is in our community, <coughs> what do we do if we have a patient in front of us who seems to have difficult or uncontrolled asthma? 
Now, as I've mentioned, it's 5 to 10% of asthma patients, and yet it's those who are associated with 90% of the healthcare burden, both in terms of hospital admissions and emergency attendances, and also the burden to themselves in terms of the impact on their quality of life. So I ask three questions when I see someone who presents with asthma that I'm unable to control with our current therapeutic. I ask, is the patient really receiving their medication? Does the patient really have asthma? And then if they have got asthma, do they have severe asthma? So I'd like to go through each of those three points again with you. The first thing to ask is, is the patient taking their medication? And this is a diagram that we put up or got together looking at patients and their attitudes to medication adherence. And what you may not think about is that every time someone sees or a doctor or gets a prescription, patients do a cost-benefit analysis. How is this going to benefit me and what's it going to cost me? Now, how's it going to benefit me has a lot to do with us as therapists saying, how can this medication help the person? And so as a therapist, we need to be engaging patients in what they think they can get out of their medication whether they, what's important to them. So if it's an 18 year old who wants to play rugby on the weekend and not have to stop every minute and take his subutamol and, not have to, and wants to play the whole game, not just the first half because he's too uh, wheezy, that can be a motivation for some. For some it can be running after their kids. For some it can be lack of fear of having a severe attack or prevention of severe attacks. Whatever it is, as a therapist, we need to identify that motivator for the patient and try and engage with them because they won't even start to think about taking it unless the benefits outweigh the risks. And patients have a bucket full of worries when they take a medication. Not only is there the cost of the medication and actually um, and accessing it, they have to make the effort, go to the chemist, pay the money. And people often ration their medications, as you know, on cost. Anyone who's talked to patients much know that if someone has got comorbidities, and many older people with asthma, the majority will have comorbidities, they do a cost-benefit. Do I buy my hypertension medication or my asthma medication? If I took my asthma medication half the rate, it'll last me twice as long, so I haven't got to take so much. If it's my kids or my medication, guess who wins? So there's lots of things people do to ration and to think hard about their medication. And that's quite apart from if they've got a chaotic lifestyle or other morbidities such as mental illness or a, um, an unstable place of address, it becomes a really big issue. So the first thing to ask yourself when you see someone with under-controlled asthma is, are they taking their medication and can I help with that at all? And it's a big ask and it's probably the biggest, easiest single reversible factor that we can attain to make a difference in the lives of asthma because we have fantastic medication and most of the time, 95% of the time, it will work well for most people if they can take it. The second thing to ask then is, do they really have asthma? And as a specialist, I certainly see a number of people who have been treating this patient for years for asthma and they're no better. Can, it could it, you know, why, why is their asthma so bad? And the first thing I think, well, have they got asthma? Let's ask the question. So consider using, uh, doing spirometry, demonstrate they've got asthma. We can often do spirometry, all general practices now if they're accredited, have a spirometer and they should be able to use it. But I should say that if someone's got bad asthma or is very short of breath, this is not a five minute spirometry you're going to do in the middle of a 15 minute consultation. This is probably going to take you half an hour. And so maybe it's better to get a specialist laboratory to do it if you've got access or to make the time to do the spirometry properly and do proper reversibility. Because without that, you won't be able to get the proper measurement. And the other advantage of using a specialist labor laboratory, if you can, is that it does give you a gas transfer measurement. And many diseases of pulmonary vasculature, such as pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary thromboembolic disease, are treated as asthma until someone realises that the gas transfer is not normal. So I think it's very... It's a very good screen for those diseases to show the person's got a normal gas transfer. And in fact, rule of thumb, in asthma, the gas transfer is nearly always increased rather than reduced. So it is a useful measurement. So consider getting get good lung function and think about how you might do that. I mean, patients don't think much of travelling somewhere for a CT scan, so why not travel somewhere and get your lung function done at the same time? Think about it. It can help us all to have a good idea and ask the question, does the patient really have asthma? And what we want to see, the hallmark of asthma, is this reversibility. And looking at the flow volume loop down here, what we can see is a greater than 12%, in this case 23% reversibility in before and after bronchodilator medication. And the, the actual defect is an obstructive one. The FEV1, the amount of air blown out in one second, 
is actually reduced compared to the vital capacity, the forced vital capacity, which is within the normal range. In this case, super normal, 114% predicted, whereas the FEV1 is reduced. But this significant reversibility is the hallmark of asthma. And it's great to see that, and it really helps us, um, it really helps to clinch the diagnosis if we see it. We don't always see it, but if I don't see it, I'm always looking to see it and trying to set it up, because it, otherwise I'm not sure that I've actually got um, an answer. Now the other thing you can do easily, and all of us have access to this, is chest imaging. I'll give you a second to look at the x-ray. Anyone want to say what it is, what they think? This is a chap who was smoking for 50 years, 20 cigarettes a day. So the key features on this x-ray is that the chest looks really large, it's hyper-expanded, and in fact the diaphragms are really uh, low. And this person had COPD, had a severe obstructive defect on spirometry and the positive smoking history was the core. Now the point about COPD is it can be very severe but and the treatment, particularly when it's severe, is different to that of asthma. And we're not going to fix them by giving them just asthma treatment nor are they getting optimal treatment if we poison them with steroids. So it's a really important diagnosis to make and we should think of it especially in people that smoke but be aware that as much as 10% of asthma occurs in never smokers. So, sorry, much as 10% of COPD occurs in never smokers. So fixed airflow obstruction, COPD, is a major and increasing burden of disability in our community and an important distinction to make from asthma. Now we can do chest x-rays. It's always a bit harder to get a CT scan, but on the other hand, some people order them like x-rays half the time. I'm always telling my residents. So sometimes you can see really useful things. This is someone who had a cough and uncontrolled asthma. And what we can see here are these widened airways with, uh, um, that are not normal. Normal airways probably look more like this. They're barely, certainly not bigger than the vessels that accompany them. And this person's got a, a very large dilated airway, which is diagnostic of bronchiectasis. And we see that in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is bronchiectasis due to long-term damage of the airway. So there is cough and sputum and chronic infection. And so those patients won't, uh, usually, they, it's very hard to treat their cough to such an extent it's not a symptom for them. And so if we're treating it as asthma, it won't reverse. And moreover, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is one of the causes of this sort of thing, can be progressive unless it's treated. So something like this would be a good reason to see a specialist and actually uh, get some good treatment to prevent progression and to minimise the infective complications. And the other thing, sometimes you get a surprise, and spirometry should point you to this, but this is interstitial lung disease where there's scarring in the lungs, pulmonary fibrosis, which can be occupationally related in people such as miners or those who've worked with silicon, but can also probably most often occur in our community in an idiopathic way. We don't know why it happens. And is often initially diagnosed as asthma until it's evident that it's not. And so spirometry will help us because it should be, have a low FVC and the C imaging will also give us a very good idea and CT scanning is definitely the best imaging for this. Now there's a huge number of other things that can also mimic asthma and at this point it's probably reasonable to consider specialist referral. But things like vocal cord dysfunction has received a great deal of attention in the community and can be important. Obesity, unfortunately if people are particularly those who are morbidly obese are often short of breath and often wheeze a bit and whilst asthma can occur with obesity, obesity itself might lead to symptoms that people might confuse with asthma and again spirometry can help gastroesophageal reflux, and other more fixed things. And I've mentioned pulmonary hypertension. So there are really a large number of differentials, particularly if someone's got severe asthma. And one should really think about that list and make sure, or certainly as a specialist I do, that they're not complicating the picture, the picture of a person that I've been sent with so-called asthma. And the third thing I ask when I've asked about, does the patient really have asthma? And are they taking their medication? Is does the patient have severe asthma? And the major way we tell if the patient has severe asthma is the medication requirement to obtain control. So when we want to obtain control of asthma, what we want to do is look at, assess the level of patient control. And this data is available on the web. It's the GINA Guidelines for Asthma Control, which is an international standard. And what we're looking to do is achieve asthma control where the person uses their bronchodilator twice a week or less. They have no limitation of activities, no night waking, um, no need or twice a week requirement for a reliever. 
and normal lung function. And we call that controlled asthma, and that's what we're aiming for in people who have asthma. And any less than that is either partly or uncontrolled asthma. And how do we do that? We maintain their medication. If they're well controlled or perfectly controlled, we uh, reduce their medication, and we increase it if their symptoms are not controlled. And the medication guideline that we use are these medication treatment steps, which are again on the GINA guidelines, the Global Initiative for Asthma website, and steps one through five look at the severity of asthma. And particularly when we're talking at severe asthma, if we need maximum dose inhaled corticosteroids plus a long-acting beta agonist, so that's a um, number of medications are available to us now, and that is still resulting in asthma that's uncontrolled, then at this level, five or above, we call it uncontrolled asthma. And those people need ongoing oral corticosteroids. Or well, now we have available, and it's agreed internationally that anti-IgE treatment is suitable. And so the international consensus definition of severe asthma is treatment that is at those GINA guidelines four, and they added on one six, which is those who are not controlled despite omalizumab for the previous year, or systemic corticosteroids for greater than 50% of the previous year to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled. And they have poor, and poor, un, poorly controlled asthma is poor symptom control or frequent exacerbations or serious exacerbations or abnormal lung function. So that's the new consensus definition of asthma, of severe asthma. All right. Unconscious time is short, so I'm just going to... One of the advances in asthma management recently has been considering that not all asthma is asthma. And so that if one looks at induced sputum, um, which was pioneered in Australia by Peter Walk's department at the Newcastle Hospital, really looking at asthma phenotypes, looking at if we look at the cellularity that's present in sputum that someone coughs up, we can actually see that there's different sorts of asthma. And in particular, those who have eosinophils in the airway are a group that are particularly important to, uh, that are, is a particular focus of treatment, are those who are likely to be responsive to corticosteroids. And Ruth, Green's from, Ruth Green, a physician in Leicester, looked at those who were treated according to their sputum eosinophils and showed that she could more than halve the rate of exacerbations in those who were treated by their sputum eosinophils as opposed to those who were treated by routine treatments. And so noticing what sort of asthma a person has can perhaps allow one to provide better advice, particularly to those with severe asthma. An alternate to doing sputum eosinophils, because not everyone wants to do it, is exhaled nitric oxide, which I think will increasingly become used. It's a very easy tool. It's a non-maximal test of respiratory function that's available now um, in a portable device that's quite reliable. And I can see that being rolled out enormously to give us an idea of whether someone's truly got eosinophilic asthma, and certainly in specialist, if not general practice. I'm just going to go on to the new treatments that I spoke about in the first part of my talk and look at those, because now we have available to us in Australia on the PBS anti-IgE treatment. So you'll know that as omalizumab or Zolia. There's only one brand available in Australia. And Zolia is an antibody sorry, um, that is designed to attach and bind to the IgE, which as you remember is IgE is the allergic antibody. It's responsible for things like hay fever. It's increased in many of those with eosinophilic asthma and is an important marker for allergic disease. And omalizumab binds to that and stops it binding to the effector cells and therefore reduces allergic events. And this is a particular study that looked at 25 patients with allergic asthma and it gave them their allergen, usually house dust mite to breathe in, and if you do, and it did it before, and before and after 12 weeks treatment with omalizumab, the anti-IgE medication they spoke about. And if we give someone who hasn't had any treatment um, allergen to breathe in, they get an early response. They get a severe asthma or sorry, an asthma exacerbation occurring about 15 minutes after you give it to them. And then if you watch them and keep doing their lung function, keep doing FEV1, they recover. And then about four to eight hours later, they suffer from a late allergic response. And as you can see, these little black dots here are what happened to them after they'd received 12 weeks of omalizumab. And in fact, their early and late response to allergen was almost abolished. It was as low as 4%. So really quite a substantial reduction in that. Whereas those who received placebo just didn't change at all. 
Now, this was the most amazing group of patients or participants in the study because not only did they have the treatment and do the allergen challenges, they went on to have a bronchial biopsy um, with, uh, bi with endoscopy both before and after their 12 weeks of omalizumab treatment. And what that showed was that the inflammation in the airways, in particular the eosinophils, were very much reduced in those who had omalizumab. So omalizumab actually treated the allergic inflammation in the airways. So this is one of the studies that really shed, said what um, omalizumab can do. But what does it do in large trials? Omalizumab has now been given to over 300,000 individuals. And overall, the big benefit it has is that it, sorry, I'm my pointer, is that it reduces exacerbations by about 40%. So it's particularly useful in those who are poorly controlled on maximum inhaled medication or requiring oral corticosteroids and in whom have frequent exacerbations. And in that group, we can expect to nearly halve the rate of asthma exacerbations in that group. So it's really quite a positive benefit and it's available on the PBS for those who qualify by specialist prescription from hospitals. And certainly many patients get a dramatic benefit and it's, it's indicated on the top stage of the GENA guidelines. So it is available. So I just want to move a little bit and say that there are actually some other treatments that are available and in the wings and probably in the next four or five years we will be able to use them and they've certainly been trialled or are being trialled in Australia as we speak. So some of you might be involved in them if you're asthma nurses because some of you I know will be doing trials. And the first of these I want to speak about is mepolizumab, that's anti-IL-5. Interleukin-5 is, is a mediator that stimulates and causes eosinophils to grow and I've already mentioned how important eosinophils are in severe asthma, those allergic cells that are in the blood. And mepolizumab is given monthly by subcutaneous injection. And in this study where they gave it to 30 patients, uh, sorry, 50, sorry, 60 patients, 30 in each group um, of those who received placebo and active, they halved the risk of exacerbations in that group. The important point about this study was they selected patients according to those who had high eosinophils. So this treatment is already being trialled and phase three studies are, have happened and are published. So this um, hopefully will be available to us in the next um, five years or so. There's also a whole family suite of these drugs that are new monoclonal antibodies for asthma. This is a study that was done on Labrikizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-13, and, and it just looked at exagen, exacerbate, sorry, it looked at treatment of 100 patients in placebo and active arms for six months with an eight-week follow-up period. And the main outcome for this study was lung function. And what it showed was a significant improvement in lung function over the whole study of about 6%. That doesn't sound like much, but the improvement in the early studies of serotide were only about 3%. So lung function is a difficult endpoint to get with asthma. But more importantly, they had a blood marker called periostin, and they showed that that group increased by more than 10, by 8%. So in that group, in a particular subgroup of severe asthma, again. So this perhaps points to the issue of personalised medicine and the growth of personalised medicine in the area of severe asthma, and that we will have targeted treatments that can make a big difference in the next uh, decade or so. And a similar study, dupilim dupilimab, which looked at exacerbations, and they particularly... Uh, treated the patients in a way to get exacerbations by withdrawing treatment from the group overall. And this was 100, 200 patients, again, 100 randomised placebo inactive. And if you look, the rate of exacerbations in the dupilimab group was 8%, I think, whereas it was 44% in those placebo. So really substantially reduced rate of exacerbations in uh, the active group. So just to conclude for you. Asthma prevalence is high and severe asthma probably runs at about 5% to 10% of those with asthma, so about 1 in 10 of those with asthma. If asthma mortality is an indicator of severe asthma, there are preventable factors in over 70% of those who die of asthma and we should be thinking about tackling those. And difficult asthma may not be severe asthma, so think about it when you see someone with difficult asthma, what can we do about it? And certainly the first step is to ask, are they getting their treatment? And in severe asthma, lots of treatment advances are now coming online with the growth of personalised medicine that really offers tremendous new vistas for us as clinicians to be able to change the outcomes of those who genuinely have severe asthma. And I think it's a really exciting time to be part of this field. So thank you.